Frank said, the new website is a single page web app powered by React, GraphQL, and Relay. If you're not familiar with these, GraphQL and Relay help us fetch and manage our data. And when I say data, I mean anything we'd need to get from an API endpoint from the server, like what the current user's name is. GraphQL is a query language, allowing us to specify which pieces of data we need. Relay is a framework that integrates with React for constructing GraphQL queries, and it handles all of the data fetching for us. So performance is an issue for a lot of websites. People are looking for fast with an app-like feel. This means a fast startup with a responsive, engaging interface. By standardizing our tech stack, we were able to rethink how we would be able to introduce the functionality people wanted in a performant, sustainable way, even as we operate at engineering and product scale. We've been able to make some changes to how we handle static resources, and the Relay team has some exciting new features that have made both our code and data faster. So one of the big challenges of a client-side rendered application is how to decrease time to visually complete. This is the amount of time it takes from when a user starts navigating to a website until all of the visible, or above the fold, content is rendered. The way we would traditionally fetch data in a client-rendered app might look something like this. First, we need our JavaScript, and then the JavaScript kicks off requests for our data, and we render a loading state while we wait. Eventually, when we have the data, we can render the final content for our users. But that means our code is a bottleneck for the data, and we want it to do better. And because Relay handles all of our data fetching for us, it statically knows what data a page needs. It has a global knowledge of the data requirements for the entire system. We can leverage this so that as soon as our server receives a request for a page, it can immediately start generating the data and downloading it in parallel with the code. By doing this, we can render the final content earlier. There's a little trick hidden in this timeline, though. The client's kicking off the request for the code, but the server kicked off the request for the data. Once the server has the data, how do we get it to the client? We do this by taking advantage of something called HTML flushing. When a browser requests an HTML document, it receives the response in pieces in the form of network packets. As it receives them, it incrementally parses the HTML, and this happens even before the entire document has been downloaded. We can take advantage of this behavior by incrementally generating and sending the markup. We start with the markup that is fastest to generate, such as meta tags and CSS and JavaScript resources that we know all pages and users are going to need. We can flush this incomplete markup to the client almost immediately after receiving the request. And when the browser receives it, it'll start to fetch the additional resources that it discovers. This is a huge win even by itself, because it lets the client start to download the CSS and JavaScript much earlier in the page load, in parallel with the server still generating the HTML. And meanwhile, the server moves on to things like page and user-specific resources. These are slower to compute, because they're more unique, and we need to know things like what A-B test the user is in. At this point, we can also start to compute the relay data on the server. We continue with this process until we've reached the end of the document. Here, we wait to send this to the client while we continue to work on generating the relay data. When it's ready, we add the relay data and flush the rest of the document. This lets us download the JavaScript and data in parallel. We're already downloading these JavaScript resources while the server generates the data, and then we stream it down at the end. And note that while I only covered the initial page load case, we can also use parallel fetching on the client for things like page transitions, modals, and tooltips. In those cases, we provide information about what the queries will need in the same place that we fetch the code that we'll need. While final render is important, we also care about time to first paint. Time to first paint is how long it takes us to put the first round of pixels on the screen. When someone's waiting for a page to load, our goal is to give them immediate feedback. And ideally, our first paint should be a well-designed loading state. By putting up UI skeletons of what the page is going to look like, the user knows the page is loading, and they can begin to orient themselves to where the content will be. Then, when we have everything we need, we can render the final content. And similarly, there's code that we need after this, like analytics and setting up real-time subscriptions for things like live comments. And these don't affect the pixels on the screen. But let's look at our timeline again. Here we have the code downloading in a single block, and we can't render until after it's all downloaded. 
But that's blocking the loading views on code that isn't required right away. So why are we downloading it before we show the loading screen? So we want to use code splitting to divide this into pieces. But depending on how we do it, this can hurt performance because we have to execute code and that pushes out when we can download it. So this means dynamic imports aren't quite right for our case. With this model, we're waiting to fetch the actual implementations and so we're actually executing the first batch of code. And this is too late. In order to fix this, we need to know statically what code we're going to need and when we'll need it. So we can download the resources as early as possible without waiting for any code execution to happen. To statically know this, we need to be able to differentiate between what we want to delay to the second phase from what we want to delay to the third phase. And we also need to be able to differentiate between these things that we want later, perhaps as a true at runtime dynamic import in response to an interaction. With a dynamic import, we don't know when the resources will be needed, so we don't know what to bundle together and what should be in its own bundle. And we don't know when to download them. So we created two new declarative APIs. And let's look at a codependency tree to see how they work. The first new API is import for display. When we add an import for display edge, it moves everything below it into phase two. And the second API is import for after display, which pushes everything below it into the third phase. With this, we're able to take our code graph and split it into our three phases at build time without having to run any code on the client. And even though these edges are completely separate in the dependency tree, we know to bundle them together in this way. We also know the order that we need to download them and when. This means we can take our single blocking download and deliver it in three phases, which lets us execute it in three phases. The loading screen, the full page display, and analytics separately. And this did a lot for us. Because the analytics block doesn't affect the pixels on the screen, it isn't really a render. And so the final paint finishes much earlier. But most significantly, look at how early we're able to render the loading screen. And this is all possible because of how we did the code bundling. Each phase will render exactly what we expect according to how the site was designed. But not only do we want to provide immediate feedback about loading, we also want to get the most critical content as early as possible. Time to first meaningful paint measures how long it takes for the primary content to be visible. And in order to do this, we really need the data to be present. When the query takes a long time, we're back in a case where we have to wait for the data before we can render the content. If we take a look at our queries, maybe the reason it takes so long for the server to return data is because we're fetching too much data or data that's expensive to compute. And the question is, do we need all of this data just to show the initial content on the page? Maybe some of the data is initially hidden or rendered outside the viewport. We usually won't need more than one newsfeed post to render the initial homepage content, so we shouldn't need to wait to fetch all of the posts before we can render anything on the screen. So we want to treat the data that we need for initial render as the most critical data. This doesn't mean that we won't need the rest of the data, only that we can afford to wait just a little longer for it, if that means that our critical data can be delivered sooner. One of the new features in Relay is the ability to mark which parts of our query can be streamed down. So as soon as the first feed story is ready, we can stream it to the client without waiting for the rest. We might also want to do similar things with non-list items. We can mark which information is less urgent, which lets us do things like get the name and picture displayed on a profile without waiting to generate the user's timeline. So given this query, we can mark which information is critical and which parts are less critical. By doing so, the server can deliver the critical data as soon as possible in a separate payload. This means that we will be able to show the initial content sooner. And as the less critical data streams to the client, we can render it as it arrives. There's a performance quirk to this as well. This can also save us a tiny bit of time to the final render. With React Concurrent, these smaller pieces that come in later take less time to render than if we'd done them all at once. But this isn't the biggest win. Depending on viewport height, it's possible that the subsequent renders are things that happen below the fold, which means we might actually be visually complete much earlier. All of the optimizations we've talked about so far have a big improvement on loading, but we're still not quite done. We need to make sure that we're only sending down the resources that we actually need. And as it turns out, sometimes the way we structure our apps can make it so we download both code and data that we never end up using. This can commonly happen when we need to render two different variations of the same UI, depending on data or other conditions. 
For example, here we have two variations of a composer. If the user is part of our A-B test, they will receive additional functionality. We want to make sure that only users that are part of this test receive the extra code. And before, if we wanted to do this on the old site, the code was imported in the middle of the startup sequence. But this is using the dynamic imports, and as we already talked about, the performance on this is pretty bad when we hit this during render. So we've moved the import to a new declarative API that's discovered via a build step. We can statically analyze that we only need this if they're in the A-B test, which lets us know at build time how to bundle these separately, and then at runtime know which version of the code to send down. At the beginning of the request, we can determine if the user needs additional code for the A-B test, which lets us ship the right code right away. This only handles the cases that we can determine at the beginning of the request, though. What are things that are based on data? For example, a single post could maybe be a photo, or it could be a video. And when we render a post, we can't tell ahead of time what type of post it's going to be. This may depend on what type of page you're visiting or which user you are. This means that our component needs to know how to render both variations of a post. So it'll need to include the code and data requirements for a photo and the code and data to render a video. But what if a user visits a page and never ends up seeing a video? Then we unnecessarily downloaded and wasted a bunch of resources that we never ended up using. And you might not think it's a big deal. It's just a little bit of wasted resources. But at scale, this is actually a huge deal because a post isn't just a photo or a video. It can be a myriad of different things, like an event, a song, an album, a fundraiser, and more. So if we downloaded all the data and code for all the different things a single post could be, we would end up wasting a ton of resources. So how do we handle this? GraphQL already handles this on the data side for us. We can model the different variations of our UI and describe the different types of posts it can be. When we write our query, we can also describe the data that we want back when a post matches a specific type. If it's a photo, we want the photo data back. And if it's a video, we want the video data back. And if it's a song, we want the song data back. When the server executes and returns the data for this query, if the post we're querying data for ends up being a video, for example, then we'll only download the video data in that request. That way, we can download the data earlier as part of the initial GraphQL request without any additional data requests. However, at this point, we still need to wait until we start rendering to go fetch the extra code. So how do we address this? That's where Relay comes in. Relay has a new feature that lets us expand this query to express which component code we're going to need in order to render the data that matches a specific type. So essentially, we're also treating the code as data itself. And here, the same conditions continue to apply. So if the post ends up being a video, we know that we only need to download the video component code. In practice, we can't just deliver this code as part of the GraphQL request, so we still need to deliver it separately. But what this does allow us to do is that as the server is resolving this query, when it knows it is going to return a video post, it can immediately let the client know it needs to download the video component code, so that hopefully we can show the final content sooner. All right, we've talked a lot about a lot of things here. Let's recap what we've covered. This is where we started. We download the code, and then the data, and then we have our final render. First, we parallelize the code and data downloads. Then we split the code download into just the code we need for the different phases, loading, render, and after render. And finally, we stream our data so we can render meaningful content earlier, even if we can't render everything. But all of these improvements are trade-offs, and we've earned other problems along the way. Looking at this timeline, there's a lot of moving pieces here, and this doesn't even include things like CSS and images. How do we coordinate when we're ready to show a loading state? And then after that, how do we coordinate when we're ready to do another render pass? We need to handle the loading experience carefully. If we get this wrong, the content can jump around, and the text, images, and icons can come in at different times. Let's look at that again. This doesn't look good. What's the right way to do this instead? We want to load the content in the order we read. So in English, we want to load top down and left to right. First, we'd load the top bar, and then the left column, and so on. In order to do this, the different pieces need to be coordinating. Any of the components on this page might be waiting on data, code, or images. And historically, centralizing the experience with React would have required a lot of engineering overhead. Now, the new React Suspense component can help us. 
As Yuzi said, Suspense is React's system for orchestrating the loading of code, data, and images. Put more succinctly, Suspense lets components wait for something before rendering. So here we have a post. If we wrap it in a Suspense boundary, then React can coordinate whether to show a loading state or the full content. And the Suspense boundary works like a try-catch. First, React will try to render the content. But one or more of these might be waiting for additional resources. Let's say the body is waiting for the image. It can throw a promise to let React know it's not ready. And the suspense boundary responds to that and renders a loading state instead. Then, once the content is ready, we can replace the loading state with the final content. And React suspense simplifies the code necessary to make this happen, and these boundaries are nestable. When nested this way, we can create the top-down and left-right loading experience we're looking for. Let's look at another video of what these look like all together. And this page loads in the same amount of time as the one that we saw earlier. This gives us a small number of paints. Images come in at the same time as the content. And the content doesn't move once it displays. And Suspense provides the veneer to bring all of this together and let us bring the code and data down in incremental pieces without sacrificing the loading experience. So I've just started to touch the surface of what performance in a client-side app looks like at scale, and we're still iterating and learning. Tomorrow morning, Joe will dig deeper on the relay changes, and Brian will talk about using developer tooling to debug and profile React components. Thank you. <laughs>